And moving from fear to reason, uh, Sylvia Bunga will be presenting uh, from UC Berkeley. Good. We'll see how, how well I operate today under uh, sleep deprivation. If I, if I don't make myself clear, please stop me, let me know. Uh, okay, so here's my very good friend, Bea. I just want to take a moment of silence to thank her for a fantastic, uh, fantastic meeting. It's great. So let's just say that Bea knows a lot about the Pittsburgh Pirates. Um, according to her daughter, she doesn't, but I didn't know that when I made this slide. Uh, I know nothing, like zero, about them. Uh, so how much more, in terms of percentage, does Bea know about this team than I do? Uh, answer A is indeterminate haven't given you enough information. B is 50% more. C is infinitely more. And D is who cares, right? Um, so who votes for A? Okay. What's the right answer? C. Okay, good. So this is basically the equation. And uh, to get that right, you have to think about the relationships between Bea and Sylvia, which run deep. Um, and uh, so right. Okay, good. So this is basically what I study, is relational reasoning, the ability to reason about the relationships between mental representations that were previously distinct that are now having to be brought together. And if you think about reasoning ability developing over childhood and adolescence, and it does, it develops very late, um, we can think about it supporting the acquisition of skills that we need in school. So for example, when you're first learning about numbers and you're trying to form a representation of the number line, you have to be able to consider uh, the co a comparison between two items. Later on, you might have to tackle fractions, and you know you might start to tackle them in grade four, but uh, there are high schoolers who still don't really understand fractions very well. Um, and so this I would consider a second order relational problem, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And then we get into pre-algebra, and then algebra, and ultimately, you really need to be able to understand that the equal sign represents um, the two things are equivalent on either side. And a lot of students don't learn it that way. They learn that the equal sign means you put the answer on the other side of the equation. And we actually think that by supporting the development of relational reasoning, we could potentially help children uh, understand, grapple with math concepts. OK, so that's something we're interested in. Um, these are kinds of tasks that we've used over the last 10 years in our lab to look at the neural basis of relational reasoning. So one is a straightforward analogy. Um, you have to be able to make comparisons, not just, um, well, yeah, I don't know where the pointer is. Uh, okay. Uh, not just between the individual items, but across them. Uh, the next example is um, a transitive inference problem here where you have to integrate two different visuospatial relationships to come up with the right answer. Uh, so here the answer would be, uh, 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 good question, okay. <laughs> purple, purple, yeah, this is the sleep deprivation coming in. Uh, this is a very well-known measure, um, Raven's progressive matrices. You see things like this on tests of IQ. I don't actually enjoy the concept of IQ per se. There are many forms of intelligence, but one of them really is this ability to integrate several relations. In this case, the way that objects are changing both in the dimension, uh, horizontal and vertical dimensions. And it turns out to be a really good predictor of academic performance. Not the only one, but it actually is. Uh, a good one. And all of these tests and many more have this kind of structure of individual relations that you have to process, and then you have to either integrate or compare these uh, in, a, in a way that we call a second order relation. And we've done a number of fMRI studies now, and we found that there's a common underlying brain network. The exact regions depend on the kind of stimuli that you're processing, be they visuospatial or uh, verbal in nature. But when it comes down to it, we see these regions over and over again, in particular the inferior parietal lobule and the rostrolateral prefrontal cortex. And, uh, and some of our studies have tried to tease these relationships apart. And um, based on our work, we think that the inferior parietal lobule is actually representing individual relationships. It, its activity scales with the number of relations you have to consider, but it's strongly interconnected functionally with the rostrolateral prefrontal cortex in humans, not in macaques, which I think is actually really interesting and, and tells us something potentially interesting about the uh, evolution of human thought. Um, and, and we believe that rostrolateral prefrontal cortex is really important for putting together these relations. Okay, uh, so this is our lab. This is our recent photo. Um, and 
we study cognitive control and reasoning, and we're looking at a number of different um, facets of that, and I'll touch on a few of them today. Okay, so these are the folks who've been most involved in the work that I'll tell you about. Emilio Ferrer is a phenomenal quantitative psychologist uh, specializing in longitudinal data analysis at UC Davis, and Carter Wendelkin is a longtime research scientist in my lab. Um, and these two lovely ladies both have just finished their PhDs and moved on to Cambridge, different <coughs> Cambridges, one in England, one in the US. Um, and uh, look out for Alison Mackey. She'll be on the job market soon, and she's phenomenal. Okay. So we're interested in the development of reasoning, its relation to school performance, how changes in brain function support this, and how the changes in brain structure uh, underlie these, these changes. And we look at all of this in the context of environment and DNA, um, and genetic polymorphisms, together with Torkel Klingberg. Um, but I won't be talking about um, most of that today. So we've done a large longitudinal study involving 201 kids. Uh, we have three time points. Um, you know, depending on the measure, and uh, it's been a very rich source of data to mine um, with funding from NINDS. So this is what we have so far. This is uh, our kids. Um, they started at age um, six. We had a couple of five-year-olds, um, and you can see that they've come in multiple times. Um, the first, the, the red lines show a change in reasoning on a factor score of four standardized measures of reasoning. Uh, uh, f so red means uh, changes from time one to time two, and blue is time two to time three. And you can see a lot of individual variability, but also a really nice trajectory as well. Okay. Um, and so the, one of the first things that we asked was, well, to what extent do, uh, does the strengthening of white matter in the brain support this emerging ability uh, to, to reason? And, uh, and so we looked at, first of all, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which connects the frontal and parietal regions that we think were, uh, are, are most critical for this uh, ability. And we also, as a test case, just to control, we looked at whole brain fractional anisotropy as a measure of uh, white matter coherence. Okay, um, and the, it turns out, you know, this is a really difficult problem. We see massive white matter development over this age range, 6 to 20, um, and we see massive improvements in reasoning, and it's really hard to try to uh, figure out what exactly is the role of these factors that are um, so closely related. Uh, it turns out that fractional anisotropy throughout the brain is a strong predictor of reasoning ability. Um, but then, um, we sought to ask, well, does it turn, oh, okay, so this arrow should, this yellow arrow should go away because the entire relationship is actually mediated by improvements in processing speed. So the way in which white matter contributes to reasoning is entirely through processing speed um, based on this, on this research. So that's not so interesting. Um, we're among friends, I can say that. But we're also interested in, uh, in, in other more sort of specific measures. Um, so this is a relational matching task that we've done uh, with these kids. And I would show you on every trial a set of four items on the screen. And I can ask you three different questions about them. Uh, the first question is, is there a match in shape between the top two items or between the bottom two items? And your answer would be, is there a match in shape? No, Jess knows the answer. Great. Um, is there a match in pattern? between the top two or the bottom two, yeah. Um, now, here comes a tricky one. Do the bottom two match according to the same dimension as the top two? Yes, okay, so that's an analogy, basically. It's like a visual-spatial analogy. Good, and so then we look at, uh, while subjects are looking at this very simple array uh, of stimuli, what happens uh, when they're engaged in the second order versus the first order problems. And again, we see our old friends, the um, rostrolateral and inferior parietal lobules. Um, and this is across all our subjects. But then w we, wanted to, uh, we wanted to break that down. Um, and so these are three different age groups. And you can see that 15 to 18 year olds, shown in blue, are showing these um, areas that we've seen multiple times in young adults. The 11 to 14 year olds are showing a different pattern, uh, primarily in a different part of uh, more posterior dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and the same thing with the 7 to 10 year olds. Um, and so, what, you know, what underlies this? And it turns out that it's, it's not because these children can't engage the correct system, uh, it's because they're not showing uh, good selectivity. 
uh, good functional selectivity. So if we look more closely at this rostrolateral prefrontal region, uh, it, and you plot it this way, you see that it's engaged similarly across ages uh, for the difficult problems, and what's actually going on is it seems to be getting um, more efficient. It seems to not have to be engaged uh, for the first order problems. Um, and this is, uh, if you look at the data individually here, these are the kids. Um, this, and this drop in um, functional, uh, sorry, in functional activation is actually associated with better performance. Okay. Um, so, we wanted to look at the relationship between parietal cortex and, uh, and this function, and it turns out that the more that parietal cortex matures, the more functionally selective this, this prefrontal region. And so it seems as though the more parietal cortex can efficiently um, handle the individual relations, uh, the more uh, selective the frontal cortex can be. So this is alluding to the um, circuitry that I'll be talking about a little bit more later on. It's definitely a network that, uh, that we've studied. Um, turns out that parietal cortex is the best predictor of future development of reasoning ability um, in you know, structural equation models that we've done. So, um, okay. So this is um, a patient that we've studied with rostrolateral prefrontal damage, and we wanted to know how well could he reason. Um, and we scanned him six months after his surgery. Um, the rough location of his um, lesion is shown with the blue circle up there. And you can see that he engages a lot of the same brain regions as, uh, as the um, age-matched controls, who are shown in blue again, um, with the exception of that one area, obviously. Uh, and so when we look at functional connectivity and we see the left um, parietal cortex, uh, the right parietal cortex here, what you see is that it's um, tightly interconnected with these um, analogous regions, homologous regions in the right hemisphere. But when you see the left parietal cortex, the main thing that you're seeing is this strong connectivity with the right parietal cortex. And so it seems as though he's reorganized what, what's generally a left hemispheric network in healthy young adults um, and reorganized it over to the right hemisphere and his reasoning skills are great. Um, and one way that we're following up on this is to look at exactly what kinds of patterns of functional connectivity can support good reasoning uh, in children who've experienced brain damage. Okay. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay. So, you know, we talk about how the brain is built, and we talk about this in terms of unilateral, uh, you know, uni unidirectional arrows from genes and environment to structure to function to behavior. But obviously, these arrows go both ways. And what interests us most, and uh, is actually the theme of this session, is um, the way in which um, experience can shape the brain. Okay, and we now have three papers um, from Allison Mackey uh, looking at um, how experience with reasoning can change both behavior and brain structure and brain function. And uh, I'll just give you some highlights from this work. So this was our first study um, published in 2011 that I've talked about before, so I won't go into details here. We took children at a low-income uh, school in Oakland, and we assigned them to two different uh, conditions where they played games for eight weeks. And we picked the games extremely carefully uh, to either require integration or comparison of several relations, what we've been studying, or to require speeded cognition based on very simple rules. And uh, what we found was um, very nice dissociable effects of these two forms of training with the children uh, in the reasoning um, uh, condition showing improvement on average of around uh, 10 uh, IQ points on a test of nonverbal IQ. Um, and so, you know, I think this is interesting. It's proof of concept that the kinds of activities that you engage in, even that you, uh, that you have your children play with, can actually influence your ability to reason. Okay. So then we moved on to a study where we could, uh, where we actually had access to um, a population that we could scan. And these were, we, we thought about different ways that we could um, look at reasoning training. We settled on individuals who were preparing to take the law school entrance exam. Um, two thirds of this exam is heavily focused on deductive reasoning. And, uh, and these individuals, they were taking a 100-hour course 
and over the course of three months, and 70 hours were focused on reasoning training. And so we took advantage of this and scanned them before and after. And uh, we showed a number of um, effects. So for example, on the law school test, um, these individuals did improve on the, on the test. Um, and this is actually now published. And they improved specifically on the two um, parts of the test that involved reasoning ability. Um, so that's great. They got their money's worth. Um, they got what they came for. We also showed improvements on transitive inference in the lab. Um, they got better at integrating two relations on uh, a test of that. Um, and then we looked at functional connectivity uh, in the resting state. And so, you know, we think of resting state connectivity as being um, an intrinsic measure of uh, connections between brain regions. But, you know, if you think about it as where, where did this, these resting state networks come from? Well, we think that they are, you know, shaped constantly through experience. And this three-month study does suggest that. These are areas um, for which the connections got stronger after three months of training in the healthy adult brain. And so um, some of these are showing, the thicker lines are showing regions within parietal cortex that are showing increased connectivity or within prefrontal. But you see a lot of uh, tightening of connections, especially in the left hemisphere between uh, frontal and parietal regions, uh, and a number of other interesting um, results as well involving the striatum. And uh, this is another way to look at the data. What we did here was simply to uh, count up the number of connections that changed in the trained group but not in the control group um, within the network that's been previously identified to be important for reasoning. And uh, you can see that our old friends, essentially the, the parietal and rostrolateral prefrontal regions, especially in the left hemisphere, were the ones that were changing the most. Um, this is, I think, pretty exciting. This is not when people are doing a task. This is resting state data, and it changes over the course of three months. Okay. So then we looked at the individuals who uh, improved the most or improved the least on the LSAT. And uh, these are the correlations. So all of these are connections that got stronger after training. But uh, the individuals who improved the least showed strengthening in uh, maybe a, a suboptimal way. Um, so the individuals who improved the least are shown in blue here. They showed a, the greatest increase in coupling between the two parietal cortices and between prefrontal and striatum, whereas the ones who improved the most, shown on the left, actually showed greater coupling between striatum and parietal and parietal and frontal. Um, and so we think this is kind of an interesting thing to think about, the striatum in particular supporting, um, su supporting uh, plasticity in the brain. So the people who improved the most, just in this simplistic schematic, showed the greatest increase in coupling between striatum and parietal and parietal and frontal. And those who improved the least showed kind of this, um, this shortcut. They showed striatum instead potentially supporting plasticity in prefrontal cortex instead. This is something that we really want to follow up on. We don't understand what distinguishes these individuals um, in terms of strategies that they might have used uh, to make these gains. Okay, so uh, I'm going to finish up with just one final slide that's uh, a teaser for a poster that is uh, up today. Um, so Jesse, where are you, Jesse? See him here? There we are. Okay, so Jesse um, is going to be presenting this, and Stenia from our lab also has a poster, but not related to this. Um, so this is work by Allison Miller Singley, a graduate student in the lab, and uh, and we've been looking at fifth graders um, again in a very poor school um, who've received chest instruction. And uh, they've actually improved, in the span of four months, they've shown an improvement in reasoning measures um, that's equivalent to uh, what we've seen previously uh, across 18 months. And uh, what we're finding, and you'll go talk with Jesse if you're interested in this, is that uh, the pattern of pupillary changes, actually even your pattern of pupil dilation, even uh, prior to the beginning of this four months, actually predicts how much you improve on reasoning. So we think this could be an interesting measure for the future. Um, and so I just want to end by thanking uh, Bea again and thanking all of you.